digestion actually starts in the mouth. A lot of people don't realize. So um, something I talk about on my Instagram all the time is how important it is to chew your food. And when we are multitasking, working in front of the computer, watching TV while we're eating, scrolling on our phone, most likely you aren't chewing as well. Subduing or, you know, the acid is not going to make the problem resolve itself. And it's probably making the problem worse. So a lot of times people might hear, oh, you're stuck in sympathetic or you're stuck in fight or flight and that's a bad thing. And in reality, we need to be able to switch back and forth between the two. I think this is one of my favorite conversations that I've had so far, especially with in regards to gut health and even just the Chinese perspective. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of For Life, a wellness podcast by Life Seasons. I'm your host, Nikki Wolf. And today we have a very special guest. Casey Hill is an acupuncturist and the owner of Flora Fauna Wellness in Costa Mesa, California. She offers acupuncture, gua sha, cupping. She's also a functional medicine practitioner who conducts virtual sessions worldwide to work with people using different modalities like specialized blood work, testing. She specializes in treating anxiety, digestive issues, and pain, where she really takes a holistic approach that simplifies these changes using diet, lifestyle, and supplement to help people feel their best. Thank you so much for being here, Casey. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, I know today's conversation is really going to talk about this interplay between gut health, the nervous system, and stress management. But I'd love to know before we dive into all that, because I think, especially as an owner, you probably have a backstory of maybe some health challenges that led you to where you are now. What did that look like? Yeah, so I grew up in rural Wisconsin. Um, my family was not, my mom wasn't a very good cook. She had a lot of TV dinners ready for us, a lot of frozen meals. Um, and at the time, I thought that I was pretty healthy all up until my 20s. But looking back now, I realize, you know, I was getting sick every month and I had a lot of uh, skin issues, especially in middle school, like acne. So that had inspired me from an early age to do something in the medical field. So in eighth grade, I decided I wanted to be a dermatologist. Um, so my plan was always to go to medical school. And then I wanted to have a little mini career in the meantime. So I moved from Wisconsin out to California right when I was 18. It was like two weeks after high school graduation. And uh, pretty soon after that, I started the esthetician program down there. So that way I was still in the realm of skincare. And once I graduated esthetician school, I moved to LA, started working at an organic spa. And through that process, not only did I learn the importance of reading ingredient labels and using organic and high quality products, but when working with clients, I also realized a lot of them were being put on things like Accutane or antibiotics without ever being counseled about like what they're eating or they're still wearing their Mac makeup to bed. And then they have all of these gnarly side effects from the medications. Um, so that kind of got me geared towards thinking about things in a more holistic uh, mindset. And when I was continuing continuing on and doing my undergrad, I took a plant medicine course and that's where everything shifted and changed for me because I was like, oh my gosh, like I can learn how to heal people with herbs. Like that's amazing. So I went to acupuncture school or Chinese medical school in um, LA. It's called Emperor's College. And while I was going to school, I was working hard. I was playing hard. Um, like I've always kind of had this wild side of me. So the combination of going to school and working and partying and not eating the greatest really led me to start to have some breakdown in my body. Um, and I started having really intense gut issues. So I went through both the Western medical route to a certain degree. And I was trying to, of course, heal it with Chinese medicine because I was in school for that. Uh, the Western side of things wanted to put me on antibiotics because they diagnosed me with SIBO and H. pylori. I decided to try to fix that herbally um, and with acupuncture and I did tons of elimination diets. So I, I've had my own fair share of going through the ringer with gut issues and it took me a good probably, you know, five to six years to really get a handle on things. Um, during that time, I was also in a pretty toxic relationship. So um with all of this, like looking back in hindsight, 
for a lot of the first few years of my practice, I was really focused on gut health. And I thought that, you know, healing the gut alone and what you ate was the only thing that was important. But the, as time went on and now me looking back at how much stress I was under and how much a toxic relationship can affect your gut as well, I'm realizing that you can't really focus on one without focusing on the other. And that's really what has inspired me, especially at this point in my practice, to focus on both gut health and anxiety because it's something that's near and dear to my heart. And the two are uh, very closely connected. So many of my patients that come in who have gut issues also experience anxiety and vice versa. Um, it's really uncommon actually to have one without the other. Um, so that's, that's something that I love working with and treating and something, you know, that even today, it's always a balance. Health is not a destination. It's not like one day you're going to land and just be healthy forever. It's this ongoing journey and constant maintenance. So, um, you know, I still have flare ups and stuff too, and I'm always constantly learning what else I can do for my body as well. I love that you kind of added that in, in the back, because I totally believe in like seasons. There's different times where we're thriving and certain times that it's really heavy and we're going to have to pivot of what we eat, what our lifestyle looks like, maybe pulling back on the high intensity workouts. Um, it's so interesting because some of the, thank you for sharing. Um, I think we actually have a lot in common that I don't think we've explored yet. Um, you know, digestive issues and, you know, uh, very toxic relationships and how that builds up. And to your point, I find so many individuals who have this connection between very intense gut issues and severe anxiety, or they have traumatic backgrounds, or, I mean, I've, I grew up in Southern California. It is, and I lived in LA the last eight years. It is go, 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 do, do, do your con like productivity. There's no such thing as monotasking. Like what is that anymore? And I think now we're coming into a world where, you know, people want to make sourdough bread and like doing grounding. And it's like, not so hippy dippy, but it's like, let's slow things down, which is like, hallelujah, that people are starting to understand that and hopefully feeling the benefits from it. But to your point, and even one, to pick up and move way across the country, I think that's fascinating. And to dive into what you're interested in. And, and again, that play between, I mean, ultimately what integrative medicine is, is there's a time and a place for Western, um, but really let's utilize Eastern approaches, diet, lifestyle, supplementation as the foundation. Let's go there first. Before, I mean, like you said, it's, you know, we're giving Accutane and we're giving all these different medications, but if we talk to them about diet, have we talked to them? Are you taking your make like simple practices? We're not even talking about. And so it's not necessarily like a poo poo on Western medicine there. It is saved lives, continues to save lives every single day and we need it. But let's make some, let's ask some other questions and become aware and conscious of some of the other things um, before we start handing over antibiotics. So that was a really cool, interesting story of just your whole journey. So now you have this practice in Costa Mesa, which is right around the corner for me and I need to come by and say hi. Um, but what does that practice look like? So I'm, you studied acupuncture. I'm, I'm guessing you utilize that in your work. Yeah, definitely. So at the uh, brick and mortar office, we have acupuncture, cupping, gua sha. Um, and of course, with my acupuncture intakes, I do a lot of the diet and nutrition consult too. So like when you first come in, we usually chat for about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how complex your case is, about the things that you're eating, about any stress management tools that you're currently using about your exercise routine. We really do a comprehensive look at those little things that you're doing every single day because that's what adds up to make a big difference in your health. So all of those diet and lifestyle things um, we chat about. And then, you know, acupuncture is like the main part of my in, um, in-house, in it's like my main in-house service, I guess. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of supplements as well. I kind of moved away from the herbs I think herbs are fantastic and can be so powerful, but I do notice that in the Western world, we have a hard time taking herbs because you need to take high doses of them and frequently. So um, if you've ever been to uh, an herbalist, a lot of times if they're giving you uh, capsules or pills, they'll want you to take like eight pills three times a day. And most people have trouble taking two pills twice a day. So you're so right. My sister just went to an acupuncturist and she was, you know, given 
I think she had like these little tiny black pellets that she had to take and she had to take like 40 of them a day. Mm -hmm. And to your point, you know, we have to also create something that's going to be sustainable. It's going to be realistic. So that was an, that's an interesting shift. Like there is beauty and benefit from behind the herbs, mm -hmm. but what are people going to do on a regular basis? And yeah, if you're not, I always say supplements only work if you take them. So like if you're bad at supplements and you're not going to do it, we need to focus more on the other you know, again, diet and lifestyle things, supplements should be supplementary to a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle. So like you can't supplement your way out of a crappy diet essentially. But um, yeah, just in my practice, I noticed that it was really hard for people to be compliant with taking the herbs. So I switched more over to um, high quality professional grade supplements. Um, so that's a big part of my in-person practice. And then I do all of my functional medicine calls virtually. Um, so I can work with people all over the world and with functional medicine, I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily know what that is. Even the name of it to me is kind of boring or it's just like functional medicine goes in one ear and out the other. Um, but basically what we do is we're using in-depth lab testing. So really comprehensive blood work, stool testing, hair tests, urine tests to do a deep dive on what is really going on with your body. And it complements acupuncture and Chinese medicine really well because both of them are using again diet and lifestyle to um like as the healing tools um you know we were talking about western medicine earlier and western medicine has a time and a place um they're really great at emergency medicine they're really great at life-saving medicine but where they don't necessarily excel is the preventative and uh long-term or chronic health issues and that's just because the tools in their tool belt are different than the ones that I have, for example. Like most Western doctors aren't taught about diet and supplement and meditation and those different things. Like those are the tools that I have in my tool belt. They have pharmaceuticals, they have surgeries. And it's like you wouldn't go to a, um, a plumber to fix your car, right? So it's just knowing when to use and when to tap into each different practitioner to really um, help you with whatever part of your health journey you're on. I think that was the best way I've heard it explained. Like, <laughs> you know, just knowing that they have their toolkit and, you know, we have ours. And so we have to know exactly what we're going for. But, you know, I'm curious to, before we dive in, um, the, cus the clients that are coming to you, they're aware of functional medicine. They're aware of integrated medicine, some different approach. Are they, like when you ask them about diet and lifestyle, are they already like pretty there? Okay, I've take, I've eliminated this. Like on average, they have to be pretty conscious of what they're putting in their body and what they're doing on a regular basis, I would assume. Um, I would say for the most part, uh, people are. But here's the thing about health information that's out there. There's so much of it and mm -hmm. there's no one size fits all approach. And that's an issue I feel like Instagram and social media is amazing because I feel like it has amplified this health revolution over the past few years, but it can get really hard and confusing because there isn't a one size fits all medicine. And even I struggle with this in my own Instagram when I'm trying to create content is like people want a quick fix. People want a solution but every body is different. So it's very hard when you're creating content or like when you're trying to give health information to the masses when health is so personalized. So, um, you know, a lot of people can come in and tell me, I hear all the time, they're like, I eat really healthy, um, this and that. And then we have them do a food journal and we talk about what they eat because what I think is healthy, especially for what your body is going through right now, might not be the same thing as what you think is healthy or what that health influencer told you is healthy. So, you know, a lot of times we'll do that look at what an average breakfast, lunch, and dinner is. And another thing about doing a health, a health journal or sorry, a food journal, a lot of times we don't realize what we're actually eating and what we're like putting in our mouth throughout the day. And it can be a really enlightening experience to just write everything down. I know that there's a lot of people that might find that challenging or it might be a little bit triggering just in case like you have, you've had like a, um, you know, eating disorder in the past. But if you know that if, if you're unaware or if you don't really know 
even if you think you know what you're eating, writing down everything can be really illuminating onto what you're actually eating. Cause like I've had people come in, they're like, I eat really healthy. And then they always tell me, they're like, Oh no, this isn't like an average day. And I'm like, I, I believe you. Cause like I've had some of those off days too. Like, don't get me wrong, but it's just like a good thing to become aware of. Like how often are you having these off days? Because a lot of times we sweep those under the rug and it's not, we're not always aware of how often that's actually happening. And again, those are the little things that add up to make a big difference over time. Couldn't agree more. I have a lot of friends who, some who just kind of started journaling, they're, you know, tracking different things. And I don't, you know, I'm not a big fan of like following certain calories, but I think just tracking what you're eating, maybe even jot down like how I'm feeling before and after just be- creates that awareness of like, am I going to food because I'm feeling sad or because I'm bored? It brings that to light. And it's so interesting because I, I have a girlfriend who has been tracking and then she kind of fell off and got back on and she just mentions how stuff just starts sneaking in. You just don't think about it. When you journal, you become more conscious and you're like, all right, I don't want to write that down. I'll just (laughs) pass it up right now. Or you might think you're eating healthy, but then you see that there's like a handful of M&Ms or whatever it is. Even if it's a small amount, if you're not jotting it down, usually at the end of the day, you're kind of forgetting that you're adding those little pieces in. And to your point of personalized medicine, I am such a believer. I'm um, I'm wanting to get certified in like stool testing and lab work and gut uh, mapping and all that stuff because I think there's such a crucial role for it, especially for individuals who go into the doctor's office, especially if you're working with a Western doctor where you have to fight for certain lab testing um, to be able to have these different types of tests ordered for you and be able to do it from the comfort of your home. I think it's fascinating, but I think we can explore this in so many ways. Um, So the the meat of the conversation today, we're going to talk about gut health and this brain to gut connection. And I think that I pretty much everybody has heard about the brain to gut connection, but we're going to explore it on a little bit deeper level, but really how does the brain and gut work together. They kind of work in this bio-directionally back and forth. You know, if you mentioned, you know, you had skin issues, but then you notice gut issues down the road. I had a season of life where I had very severe gut issues. And then it was a few months later that I had very intense, um, like brain mental issues, um, and kind of goes back and forth. So there's this very strong connection. I'd love to explore what that is and why that's happening. Yeah. So the two are, like you said, are so interconnected that I kind of like to look at this in two different ways. First, um, let's talk about how the gut affects the brain. So um, everyone's heard about the microbiome and those are those little bacteria that are in our gut. There's trillions and trillions and there's a bunch of different strains or species, um, kind of like how there's, you know, a bunch of different species of dogs or fish. Same thing with all of these little bacteria that are in your gut. And so some of them are really beneficial for us and help us make energy and neurotransmitters and they help to make up our immune system. And then there's other strains or species that are not so beneficial for humans to have. And so we want a very diverse microbiome. So that means a lot of different types of species. Um, And we also want there to be not too much and not too little. And so something that can happen is if you are taking a lot of antibiotics that can wipe out, you know, not just the bad bacteria, but also those good bacteria. And so if we don't have enough of those good bacteria to make our neurotransmitters, if we're talking specifically about like anxiety and the connection between our gut and mental health, um, you know, if we don't have those neurotransmitters being made like GABA and dopamine and serotonin, you're not going to feel happy and motivated and um, ready to take on the day. You're going to feel more depressed. You're going to feel more anxious. So that happens a lot of times after people have taken a lot of antibiotics. Um, another way that this can happen too is if you're eating the exact same foods every day and you're not eating a very diverse diet, different foods, specifically, I'm talking about like vegetables and meat, um, real foods that you'd find in nature. Those are what help to make each of those different strains flourish. And some strains and species of bacteria probiotics, like, you know, or flourish with broccoli, we'll say others uh, flourish with the different things that are found in um, sweet potatoes. And so if you're just eating the same four foods every single day, 
um, that can make it so you have a really limited and not diverse bacteria um, population. And so that can also affect your mood and your energy levels and just how you feel in general. Um, so again, one of the ways that the gut affects our mood and our brain is through the microbiome. Another way that, um, the gut can affect our mood is that if we have a lot of inflammation in our gut, um, there is a direct connection between, um, or highway, I should say, between the gut and the brain. It's called the vagus nerve, which is becoming a lot more popular these days. And you can think of that as like a direct phone line or a direct highway that sends messages from the gut up to the brain and then back down from the brain to the gut. Um, so it's a two-way street. If we have inflammation in our gut, whether that's from a uh, gut infection like SIBO or H. pylori um, or um, say you pick something up when you were traveling in Thailand, that inflammation from that infection can tell our body that we're feeling that something's wrong. And it sends a message via the vagus nerve up to the brain that we're unsafe. It stimulates that fight or flight um, response in our body. And that can cause chronic anxiety as well. So infections are one way that that can happen. If you're eating a lot of processed foods and alcohol that causes inflammation in the gut, that again is going to tell the body, hey, something's not right. We're unsafe. Trigger that anxiety. Um, if we think about it in the other way of more so the way that our brain affects the gut when we are stressed, right? So many of us deal with chronic stress these days. It's pretty rare for me to find anyone who says that they're not stressed, right? Like you were saying earlier, um, you know, we're in the do the most, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, population down here, especially in Southern California. And I'm sure if anyone's listening in like New York or any bigger city, it's going to be this fast pace. Like how much can you multitask today? How much can you get done? When we are in that constant state of go, 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 that also triggers the fight or flight response in our body and um, makes it so our body is preparing for, like we said, fight or flight. And what happens physiologically is our brain sends a, sends a message down to our organs to send all of the blood away from the organs that aren't necessary for fighting or flighting. So digestion is going to slow down because if you're fighting off a tiger, you don't really need to be digesting at this point. You need that blood flowing to your arms and legs. You need it flowing to your heart and your lungs to pump blood through, um, through the body. So you are able to either get away or fight. So when we're stressed, we have gut motility slow down. And that means that rhythmic motion that put, that pushes the food all the way down through your intestines that slows down and can either back you up and cause constipation. Or there's some people who will experience more of like an IBS, um, diarrhea style, uh, response to where the body's like, all right, get it all out, abort. We got, we've got some fighting or flighting to do. And so you might get that like, um, running to the bathroom SOS stress response as well. Um, so it can really happen in one of those two ways. Like I said, either diarrhea or a lot of other times people get constipation. Um, something else that happens when we're in that chronically stressed state is we produce less stomach acid. And so we actually need stomach acid in order to digest our food. We need stomach acid in order to kill any bacteria that's coming in from our food. And we need stomach acid in order to um, activate the different digestive enzymes that are being pumped in from the pancreas. So um, some other things in addition to stress. And Casey, I just want to cut you off real quick because yeah. I want to press into this because what you just said is so important for listeners to hear. I'd love to kind of set some time and talk about stomach acid because they're, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of our listeners are pretty conscious with health and even integrative medicine but we think, okay, we're having heartburn, we're having indigestion, Tums, or even like a natural form of Tums. I know that there are certain um, integrative companies that have, my neighbor brought one over um, to show me and I'm like, okay, I'm liking that there's natural ingredients, but subduing or, you know, the acid is not going to make the problem resolve itself. And it's probably making the problem worse. So could we kind of sit into that for a little bit of talking about stomach acid and why it's probably not the most beneficial thing to be taking a Tums or an antacid if we are experiencing some of these issues. 
Totally. I'm glad that you stopped me right there. Cause that, like, this is such an important point. Um, cause so many people are, you know, taking Zantac or Pepsid or they go to the doctor and they're like, you have a uh, GERD and they put them on like a PPI or H. pylori, you know, there's, there's so much here that is, um, affected by stomach acid. And so let's, let's look at this, um, from the point of view of the Western, the Western way of looking at it, right? They're saying that you need an antacid because there's too much stomach acid. That's what we've been told for, you know, the past 10 to 20 years. And there's actually not a lot of data that backs that up. This was kind of one of those things where the pharmaceutical companies took it and ran with it. Um, and here's why. If it was indeed a issue of too much stomach acid, you would then find that the highest population of people who are experiencing acid reflux would be teenagers or young, young kids, because the things that start to deplete our stomach acid is aging first and foremost. And so let me talk about a few other things that deplete stomach acid too. So aging, stress, alcohol, um, vegan diets, um, Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Processed foods, those, all of those things will start to decrease the amount of stomach acid that we make. So again, if it was indeed an issue of too much stomach acid, and we know that aging starts to deplete it, you would find that the highest population of people who have acid reflux would be teenagers or younger kids as opposed to the elderly. But that's completely opposite. Like think about how many old people, your grandparents, maybe your parents, so many of them have stomach acid issues or they have, they have to take heartburn medication with every single meal. And so what's actually happening because you're like, what do you mean? Like I feel, I can feel the acid in my stomach. Like I can feel the burning sensation. Um, but what's actually happening is when you don't have enough stomach acid, your food sits in your gut longer and it starts to ferment because, you know, acidic things trying to break down the food. It does. It's not either not moving down away from the stomach or it just doesn't have enough of that digestive power. So it starts to kind of bubble up like beer or kombucha. You can imagine that like pressure building in your stomach. And at a certain point, that pressure starts to open up this flap between your stomach and your esophagus. And it's called the esophageal sphincter, which I just, I love saying that word. Um, I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite sciencey words. Uh, so it opens up that flap and that acidic contents from your stomach starts to bubble back up into your esophagus. Your stomach can handle the acid. It's made for the acid. Your esophagus, not so much. So that's why you start to feel it, that burning sensation in your chest. It's because that acidic food contents is starting to bubble back up um, where it's not supposed to be. And so people then ask, hey, well, then if that's the case, why does taking an antacid make me feel better? And that's because it goes down and it soothes the acid that's in the esophagus. But then when you're reducing the acid that's in your stomach, you're perpetuating this issue even more. And so, like I was saying earlier, acid, stomach acid is so important, not just for digestion, but it's also important for killing bacteria. If we have a non-acidic stomach, that's not going to kill the different bacteria and parasites and critters and different things that make that originally or should be killed in the stomach and it makes it down into our small intestine. It can make it down into our large intestine. And that's when we start to see things like uh, SIBO or an overgrowth of bacteria in your large intestine. So it's really important to break that cycle of um, popping Zantac and Pepsid AC and all of those different antacids. And I'm sure the next question is, so what do we do instead? Um, and, you know, I would say reduce stress, um, make sure you chew your food. Digestion actually starts in the mouth. A lot of people don't realize. So, um, something I talk about on my Instagram all the time is how important it is to chew your food. And when we are multitasking, working in front of the computer, watching TV while we're eating, scrolling on our phone, most likely you aren't chewing as well. And so, that means A, you're not mechanically breaking down your food with your teeth. You're B, not signaling to your stomach that, hey, we're about to digest some food, pump up the stomach acid, pump up the bile, release the enzymes. Um, so you're not getting that signaling to prepare it. The third thing is that um, we have 
an enzyme in our saliva called amylase, which breaks down carbs. And so again, if you're just like shoveling your food down and not chewing it specifically with carbs, um, you aren't going to digest them as well at all. And that means more work for your stomach to do. So if you're not chewing, not only are you sending these bigger chunks of food down to your stomach, you're also not like basically catching your stomach off guard. And so it's going to perpetuate the issue even longer of food just sitting in there. So chew your food, try to de-stress as much as possible, limit alcohol intake, um, eating a diet with that's primarily plants of protein, um, like animal protein specifically. And then um, in terms of supplements, what you can do is find something that has hydrochloric acid in it. Hydrochloric acid is the type of acid that we have in our stomach. This is a conversation that needs to be communicated all over the place because I still know there's so many individuals, even if they're, they are somewhat conscious of health um, and just the wellness industry, that's still something that completely goes over to your head. And, and you touched upon something. There is a reason for the acid in our bodies to kill some of these bacteria that shouldn't be here. It's just like this idea and this concept that when we suppress certain acute issues, that's going to lead to chronic issues. And that's what we're finding here. Same with um, antibiotics and other forms of, you know, even Tylenol and all these things, when we're suppressing the fever, so suppressing what is our bodies are built to heal itself. And when we give it the right ingredients and the foundational support, it will heal itself. I think it's Hippocrates that said, if you can give me, I don't know if it was a medicine or it was something, if you can give me something that creates a fever, I can cure all disease. Don't quote me on that, but it was something to that extent. If you can induce a fever, the fever will actually kill all this stuff. And so when we're doing so much to sub subdue the fever, the fever is actually what's trying to kill off the bacteria or the virus or what's going on in the body. So the same point with your acid conversation, when we are trying to reduce the acid, that's what's trying to do the work. So I am very, very grateful that we explored that a little bit. I know you've mentioned, you know, there's different organ systems that are involved in this gut to brain connection. I'd love to hear a little bit more of your perspective with the uh, traditional Chinese medicine. I think, you know, talking about the stomach and the spleen and what their role is in relation to the gut to brain connection. Totally. So in Chinese medicine, we look at the body a little bit differently and everything is connected, whether that be the mind and the body um, or, you know, your liver to your heart, to your kidney. Like every organ system has a, checks and, a check and balance with, um, with other organs. And so specifically to this point, I want to talk about how each of the different organ systems are connected to emotions, because I think that that's something that's really lacking in most of our um, you know, view of the body, just because most of us were raised, you know, in this, in the Western world where things are all separated, right? And like the, we don't really, the mental health sections over here and the physical health section is over here. But so, um, in Chinese medicine, all of the different organs in the body are broken down into systems. Um, and so specifically we'll start with the spleen and the stomach. And a lot of times when people hear this, they're like the spleen, like, what does the spleen even do because like in the from the western point of view it helps a little bit with the immune system but people don't really talk about the spleen that much in chinese medicine uh the spleen and the stomach are two of the main digestive organs and so i think there was actually like a mis a misnomer like a translation issue when uh they were talking about the spleen and i think of it more as like the pancreas because the spleen is all about uh breaking down food and turning it into fuel and so the spleen and stomach together um, help to not only digest food, but they also help to digest ideas and the information that you're taking in from the world. So each of these organs is are digesting um, experiences, right? So when we start to pay attention to the world around us. If we're having a hard time digesting our external environment, a lot of times that can bring on anxiety. Oh, what and do you mean by absorbing our external environment? I 
Just when we are sitting here, you know, looking around, we're using our five senses to take in the information from the world around us. So I'm seeing, you know, the grass outside. I'm seeing the table in front of me. I'm smelling um, and breathing in the air. Um, and like my different sense organs are taking in this information, sending it up to the brain and then digesting it. And that's when we start to create different feelings and emotions from what we are seeing all around us, right? So with the, when I'm talking about the spleen and stomach digesting our external environment or our emotions, um, it's about taking all of that information in, taking in our past, taking in our feelings and breaking that down in different ways to, um, for us to absorb it. And so when we think about it in the sense of anxiety, anxiety is generally an unease, right? It's that something isn't being digested well, like whether we can't, maybe it's like a social anxiety where it's like there's overstimulation and we're having a hard time assimilating that into our body. Um, or maybe it's the anticipation of something coming up. We're having a hard time dealing with that. And so as I was saying with this, the spleen and the stomach um, have their emotion being anxiety, just to compare with the other organs, the liver and gallbladders emotion is anger. And so the liver and gallbladder's main, um, one of their main roles in the body is to make sure that the chi or the energy is flowing smoothly through the body. And so if we think about anger, irritability, which is their emotion, um, when things aren't flowing smoothly, a lot of times we call that stagnation where it gets stuck. It's almost like there's an ener energetic traffic jam in our body. And what happens a lot of times when we're stressed is we tighten up and we tense up and that can cause even more of that traffic jam, right? And so then everything starts to feel like it bottles up and eventually that, lean, that leads up to anger and irritability. And so when we're talking back with the spleen and the stomach, yes, they have this role of digesting food and turning it into fuel, um, but they also have this role of digesting emotions and processing them. And so what we see a lot of times is people who have digestive issues, um, whether it be because they are multitasking, they're not chewing their food well enough, maybe they're eating things um, that the body just doesn't really know what to do with, like processed foods. Um, that stuff can cause a backup in the spleen and stomach, and you're going to get bloating, you might get constipation, you might get diarrhea, um, but that can also cause brain fog. It can also cause anxiety because again, if we think about it in the Western, the Western way of thinking, we're causing inflammation and we're messing up that delicate balance of the gut microbiome. And so that is the direct connection between the gut and anxiety, especially in Chinese medicine. And so when we start to focus on healing the gut, eating warm and cooked foods that are way easier to digest, um, a lot of times your anxiety is going to reduce as well. Um, I love the way you explain that and just really talking about how our body is so interconnected. I mean, we know gut brain, we know we've heard that. I don't think everybody knows exactly to the extent of what that means. And I think that helped really create this foundation for a deeper understanding and even talking about the vagus nerve, but so many different parts are connected. And I'd, I'd love to explore more of traditional Chinese medicine because, you know, even talking about the Chinese body clock, I don't know why I said that's so a word, but Chinese body clock <laughs> where, you know, a lot of individuals would wake up between three to 4 a.m. And I think that's the time where your liver, your gallbladder, I know that the liver, gallbladder and lungs are kind of in that range. And so that could be an indicator that maybe there's something going on with those different organs. And so really understanding that your body works all together. And again, to the point that we, our bodies have the innate ability to heal itself. And so we just got to listen. We start need to becoming aware of what's going on. Now talking about stimulation, because, you know, we're talking about external stimulation, but there is a kind of form of stimulation that is good. And in regards to the vagus nerve and different ways that we can stimulate the vagus nerve to help support our brain and gut health. What does that mean to stimulate the vagus nerve? And what are some different ways that we can do that? So, when we're thinking of stimulating a nerve, right, we can kind of think of with exercise. So a lot of times people think when we are going and let's say we're doing a bicep curl or something, we think that we are stimulating the muscle, which isn't 
completely incorrect. But what we're actually doing is we're stimulating the nerve in our, our brains are sending a message down to our body via the nervous system being via the nerves. Hey, we want to activate and move our arm. And so, yes, we are using the muscle, but the nerve is what is contracting and pulling the muscle. And so when we're exercising, it's we're actually toning the nervous system, which then causes a breakdown in the muscle. And that's where you, a lot of times you'll feel like a little sore afterwards is because we're creating all these little micro tears to, um, for then the muscle to rebuild. And that's how we start to build bigger muscles. But so just like we're toning essentially the nervous system by exercising, um, we can tone the vagus nerve. And so the vagus nerve, just to give you guys a visual, it runs from the brain all the way down the body. The name vagus means wanderer, um, just because it, it goes to almost every single, it has a connection with every organ in our body. Um, and it runs all the way down our body. So ways that we can work to stimulate it are going to include humming because it runs on either side of the throat. Um, gargling is another really good one. And when you gargle, you want to make it so you're making noise when you gargle and you want to do it to the point to where your eyes start to water. Um, that's how you know that you're doing it well enough to the, to get the vagus nerve actually stimulated. Um, interestingly enough, the ohm, like when people meditate and do long ohms, that stimulates the vagus nerve directly. So that's another really good way to do it. Um, and then of course I have to talk about acupuncture too, cause that's what I do. Um, but there is part of the vagus nerve that runs into the ears. So auricular, which means ear, ear acupuncture is, uh, specifically super helpful for toning the vagus nerve. There's a couple points on there. I mean, there's a lot of points on there that can stimulate and calm down the vagus nerve, which means that it's helping to tonify or tone that your nervous uh, system strength to switch back and forth between the sympathetic, which is our fight and flight and the parasympathetic, which is the vagus nerve, uh, rest and digest. So a lot of times people might hear, Oh, you're stuck in sympathetic or you're stuck in fight or flight. And that's a bad thing. And in reality, we need to be able to switch back and forth between the two. Um, but so many of us are just stuck in sympathetic that we need to tonify that nerve or like, you know, work it out and strengthen it by gargling, humming, um, oming <laughs> to get it to where we can switch back into parasympathetic when we're not in, you know, an acutely stressful situation. Fantastic. I learned a lot right there. Um, you know, I had some ideas on vagus nerve, but I didn't really know the intricacies of it. And, you know, we, we do talk about parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic and how certain herbs like chamomile can help make that switch. But to your point is, we also need to strengthen that nerve so that we can make that switch. So that was beautifully said. Are there any, we've covered so much in this. Um, I think this is one of my favorite conversations that I've had so far, especially with in regards to gut health and even just the Chinese perspective. Are there any other sort of lifestyle tips, um, diet changes that you'd recommend if somebody is struggling with whether that's some gut issues or maybe more of the emotional issues? Yeah. So one of my big things is eating breakfast, which is kind of the opposite of what so many people are doing right now because intermittent fasting is so hot right now. Um, but especially for women, um, and women who are stressed out, you have kids, you're doing all these hit workouts, you're doing the most. Eating breakfast is going to be one of the biggest and most important changes that you can make specifically. And this is going to probably ruffle a lot of people's feathers a warm and savory breakfast. So that means ditching the smoothies, ditching the sugary stuff, ditching the overnight oats with fruit. Um, blood sugar management is a huge component, component of nervous system management. Um, and so when you are either skipping breakfast or you're eating sugary stuff for breakfast, um, that is setting your blood sugar on this roller coaster all day. That's going to leave you hangry, anxious, and just in a state of chronic stress. Um, so by switching over and eating something like eggs and veggies, uh, making sure that you're getting enough animal protein um, and good fats too, 
you're not only going to be able to make it all the way to lunch without having to snack or feeling irritable or feeling hangry, but you're also going to have more sustained energy throughout the day. You're going to sleep better. Your hormones are going to be more regulated. This is like one of the most important things that you can do, in my opinion, for every aspect of your health. And if you're going to intermittent fast, if you're really set on doing this, um, I would stop eating earlier in the day. So eat earlier and then stop eating earlier, eat a smaller dinner. And that is just going to be better for your hormones, for your circadian rhythm, for pretty much every aspect of your health. You know, I have different guests that come on and what I love about having a podcast is you can have a conversation about something and agree to disagree on certain things. Like everybody brings their perspective and insight. And I think that's so valuable, especially with an audience that, you know, a lot of us are air experimenters. Like, let's try this out. Let's see what works best for my body. But I could not agree more with what you just said. And touching back into personalized medicine, my mom, who's, you know, menopausal, who lives in a very calm community, she's retired, you know, she doesn't have a lot of high intensity or external stimulation, she can afford to do more of an intermittent fasting. She can afford to kind of mix things up. But the majority of us, I would say if you are perimenopausal and younger, if you have a go, go, go environment, if you're raising a family, just that alone, um, I think women tend to wear a lot of hats and we just, you know, maybe it's not even a woman thing. I think just even men, they wear so many hats and we're just if you have stress on your plate in any capacity, intermittent fasting, I don't believe is for you. Um, I think we need to pull back. My first functional medicine doctor, she was like, pull back on the high intensity workouts. I mean, I was doing Barry's boot camp at like 5 a.m., intermittent fasting and having coffee. I mean, I couldn't be doing more damage to my body and to my nervous system, but flooding your body, nourishing your body, doing more, you know, low intensity walks, Pilates, yoga, warm foods. Um, I just finished a season all on blood sugar and I'm a huge proponent of understanding blood sugar. And I thought I knacked, I do, I eat this thing every day called a berry bowl. And it's like a very, like I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor and didn't even budge it. And it was a kind of a sweeter breakfast. And so it was cottage cheese. There was a little bit of frozen blueberries. There was um, acacia fiber, protein powder. One thing that I haven't given up is protein bars. I do love protein bars. Um, and then I'll do almond butter. Sometimes I'll do chia seeds or flax seeds. So when you look at it, and it's a very small amount of blueberries, you're not really getting a spike. Spike The the protein in there, the fiber in there, and the fat content is going to modulate that. And even though that didn't spike my blood sugar, I'm still having cold in the morning. And if I'm still you know, experiencing gut issues, because I was actually thinking about this, maybe at the end of every episode, I can ask the guest and maybe, sorry, you're going to be my guinea pig. I haven't even thrown this out to you. To have the guest share one thing that they're actually struggling with, because I think mm -hmm. when we can normalize that, even though we're experts, doesn't mean we've got it all together. There could be certain seasons that we're thriving with X, Y, Z, but there's other things that we're struggling with and just to normalize these kind of things. So I might throw that out to you. But okay. my point is, as I started to make this shift, I love my berry bowl. I absolutely do. But if I'm in one of my things that I'm struggling with, even though I'm in the gut season right now, is I am kind of struggling with some digestive stuff right now and whatever, I'll just put it out there. If I'm an, I gotta be the first. Some constipation. Um, I think I went very hard in the paint of fiber, you know, vegetables, um, but I'm not consuming enough warm foods, enough kind of grounding foods. It's, I, I have a lot of salads. Um, I have plenty of fiber, too much fiber. And so I'm trying to find the balance, um, you know, adding more magnesium, adding more cooked foods, warm foods, soups, saute, because I do love my vegetables and diversity, diversity, diversity. You nailed it earlier on in the episode that having a variety of foods, especially uh, vegetables, I think is so important for our gut health. But with all that being said, I switched over to having more warm breakfast. Um, it just, maybe I was doing more of the cold because I love the taste and it was really quick. And with a one-year-old grabbing my leg, I just wanted something that was quick. But now I'm making eggs and I saute zucchini, uh, kale. I top it. I do three eggs. I top it with either half an avocado or quarter 
some feta cheese, feta cheese, one or the other, um, sundry tomatoes, good amount of Himalayan sea salt. And I have, because normally I've been pretty low carb. I'm now having a piece of toast with it. I would recommend sourdough toast, but I'm just kind of working off some other, I think it's Dave's killer bread right now. I'm just kind of use that up and then maybe I'll start making my own who knows, but moving towards that warmer breakfast. So if you are listening and you are going towards those more smoothies, even with the summer coming up, it's going to be hot. Probably I would still recommend starting the day with that warm food. I'm curious too, Casey, and this could be controversial and you could feel completely different than I do. I've had a variety of guests say, okay, eat a huge breakfast where you are almost oversatiated. I personally, that doesn't resonate with me. I think eat, be mindful, especially individuals who have experienced eating disorders. I just can't imagine that being healthy when you're like, overeating where you feel discomfort. I think slowly start being conscious, being aware, but one egg is not enough. Two eggs is not enough. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you touched on so many good points and clarifications. Cause it's like, again, like I was talking about earlier in the episode too, where it's like, there's so much that we can say on here that is trying to help the masses are, you know, I'm like, in general, this is how I feel about this certain topic, but you really did dive into like with your, where your, uh, the continuous glucose monitor, like that is such a good representation of how individualized health is. Um, because there are things that can spike my blood sugar that wouldn't do the same thing for you. And so it's like, we can make these generalized statements, but unless we have something that's tracking the data, um, and showing us what's actually happening in the body, it's really hard to tell what's happening or what's the best for your body. Um, but back to the question on overeating, I <laughs> pretty much anytime we deviate into one of the extremes, um, you know, even if we're talking about like cold plunging, that's a whole nother thing or like excessive use. Oh, right. or Okay. Ex- we're going to do a separate episode on that. Yeah. Let's, we'll, we'll, that'll thoughts. be a, yeah. 2.0. Yeah. Um, but anytime you're deviating in the extremes, especially for Chinese medicine, like they're all about balance. And, you know, there's a reason that always saying like, I, I don't know that I believe in everything in moderation, but like a lot of things in moderation or the more that you can stay in balance. I don't think balance. crack in moderation is probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, you know, probably we'll probably pass on that one personally. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but like overeating, like I, you know, I'm, I'm very big on mindful eating, listening to your body. And again, going back to when you chew your food and you're not multitasking, you're going to be able to tap into that. And your body's going to tell you when you're, you're good and ready to be done far more so than if you're like in a scroll hole and just like shoveling your food into your mouth. And then you're going to feel bloated and, you know, not great all morning. Your energy's going to be low. You'll probably get brain fog. So definitely paying attention to what and how much works for you. And another point that you brought up that was really great is all those different forms of stress, right? Like if you're intermittent fasting, that's another form of stress or it's another layer. Um, And while a lot of times we think like, okay, there are benefits to fasting, there are benefits to hit workouts. But when you have too many of those layers of stress on top of your psychological and emotional stress, it's just like too much for your body. So same thing with when you're eating, right? Like if you're doing a bunch of more intensive workouts or, um, you know, you're going through a lot more, you might require more food. Whereas like there's other times where your body might not require as much food. And it's important to pay attention to that and know that that can fluctuate just depending on everything else that's going on in your life. So again, there's not one size fits all cookie cutter um, piece of health advice that we can give you. Like, you know, when you go on a podcast or when we're on Instagram, we're trying to do the best we can to give you this information that you can take and use. And it's all about trying it on and figuring out what's right for you. But remembering what's right for you is going to fluctuate every day. So, um, you know, just paying attention to how your body feels and really tapping into that intuitive, um, mindful connection. Yes. All right, Casey, we're going to put you on the spot. What is <laughs> one current health challenge that, that you are struggling with? Mm. So I have been waking up, um, waking up, like you were saying earlier, um, usually between the hours of one and three, which you touched on, and that's the time of the liver. And so like I dropped, like I was saying earlier, the liver 
generally has to do with stress and like repressed anger or irritability. Um, it can also do with detox issues as well. So if you're waking up between one and three, that's one of the things um, that can cause it, especially from the Chinese medicine viewpoint. Um, and so I have been having a lot of fun on the weekends recently. And I think that that is contributing um, to me waking up between one and three. I also think that I have a lot of stress going on right now, just between I've had mold in my apartment um, that I've been having remediated. It's, it's all good. It's all working out for the best and they're almost done. Um, but I think that's, that stress, you know, working on my business is always stressful and I just have a lot of events coming up. And then also like I've been traveling a lot and going out and having fun. So um, the way that I plan on rectifying that is taking some more adaptogens um, and herbs that are going to help uh, regulate my stress levels. Um, I get weekly acupuncture as well. I think I might bump it up to two this, this week. Um, and then just starting to say no to a lot of things because we can, it can be really exciting, especially like the, where I'm at right now is like, there's a lot, all these exciting things coming up, whether it be social events or, um, you know, work events that I'm doing, but <laughs> at some point you might start to get overwhelmed. And I think that might be where I'm at. So, yeah. um, you know, tapping into more of those tools, uh, my meditation, journaling, calming down, saying no, um, staying in on the weekends and just being chill, I think is, is what the doctor is ordering for me. Well, I appreciate you being the guinea pig and sharing and I opening up with that. Um, cause I, and so maybe that's something that will continue because again, even though if we're coming as the expert, it doesn't mean we have it all together. And there might've been a season where you were thriving with that, but things change and there's, you know, seasons to life. So I appreciate that. Where can listeners find out more from you? Um, social, maybe they are across the country or they are locally, where can they find more about you and your work? Yeah. So my main, um, social media is on Instagram and that is at flora fauna dot wellness. Um, you can also check out my website, flora fauna wellness.com. If you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one. um, I feel like just based on the conversation today, you guys probably have a good idea that sometimes you just need a little one on a little extra one-on-one -on -one help. And if you're at that point where you're feeling stuck because you feel like you're doing all the things that are healthy and you are on this path and you're like, what am I, what more could I be doing? Getting expert help can help you fine tune those things and figure out maybe what's working for you and what isn't. Um, so yeah, I'd love to work on work with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, via functional medicine, or if you're local in Orange County, my office is in Costa Mesa for acupuncture, gua sha, cupping. So if you have anxiety, gut issues or pain, I'm your girl. I got you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here, Casey. This was a fun conversation that took a lot of different pathways, but I think we pulled so much out of this. Um, yeah, I just appreciate your your work, um, being the guinea pig, opening up and just providing all this incredible insight. Thank you so much. 